you got this huge age difference. Mm -hmm. You're you're with a very traditional man. Yes. Who's also a celebrity. Yeah. Who also, <laughs> you know, women are like They're eager. After him. Si agara, camina, está si. samulada. Camina, si. ay mamita, camina, anda. Camina, si. sal un poquito para acá. Camina, sí. Si. Today I have the privilege to bring to you an amazing on-air personality named Debbie B, also known as Debbie Jackson. She's been on radio for the last 25 years. And I hope that you enjoy her as much as I do. Please give it up for Debbie B. I first met you mm -hmm. when you started dating Hal Jackson. That's correct. Who I affectionately call my papa. Yeah. For those watching who don't know who Hal Jackson is, mm -hmm. Hal Jackson is a legend in broadcasting. Hal, 1939, started doing radio when there were hardly no blacks doing radio. He started as an announcer. He was doing baseball in D.C. Mm -hmm. And then, at some point, moved to New York, uh, was also doing sports, I think, and then started doing radio with music. Mm -hmm. He also had this big... Palisades Amusement Park show that he would do. Mm -hmm. He also did Little Miss America from Palisades Amusement Park. Mm -hmm. And he then uh, started Inner City Broadcasting, which became one of the biggest radio stations and broadcasting corporations in the country for black radio. Mm -hmm. So he was instrumental in so many artists having a career. They're too numerous for me to just go down the list. It's mm -hmm. just he knew everybody. He gave everybody opportunities. And he did radio for over 75 years? 72 years. 72 years. He was on radio up until he died. Two weeks prior to his death. And he's got a book called The House That Jack Built. So if you don't know him, you really need to go to Amazon and find that book because he is black history in radio. He's one of the forefathers of R&B, even rock and roll. He was there mm -hmm. before Freeman, mm -hmm. Alan Freeman. That's so right. he's got an incredible story. Anyway, that's who we're talking about. Google him, okay. Al Jackson. Yes. I uh, graduated from high school and immediately got married because I was pregnant. So my first marriage only lasted about four years. Mm -hmm. So I had been married wow. okay, and knew what that was about. I have a beautiful daughter. Then I went to Fordham uh, University and studied creative writing. Let's you went see. to the Bronx campus or Manhattan? The Bronx, okay. Bronx campus. My husband and I broke up. I then had to go to work. So my first job was at the Neighborhood Youth Diversion Program. So I was working with kids that were delinquent. At that point, that's when I knew I liked working with kids. Mm. Okay. Did that for a few years until the city went through bankruptcy or something like that, and I went for like four or five weeks without getting paid. I said, wow. nope, I can do better than this. Moved from there and became the assistant director of affirmative action at Fairleigh Dickinson University in the Bronx. I met Hal when I was young because Hal was dating my Aunt Flora's best friend, Carol Nash. So every time we had a family event, he was there wow. for Christmas, for Thanksgiving, for New Year's. He was always there, was always there. As a matter of fact, I have a picture of, <laughs> of him and I, and I was nine months pregnant with Tanya, but he was with Carol. Okay, in 1981, he told my, my aunt that he was looking for a wife. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm not looking for a husband, but Mm, I'll go out with him. He was living here in L.A. I'm living in New York. So he flew in. We went out. But every time we went out, you know, Hal always went out with a lot of women around. Him. Yes. So nobody ever knew what was going on. Then I said, okay, I think I could kind of do this. But I was still dating, and he was here, mm -hmm. and I was there, so eh, it was cool. Then he really sprung things on me. He said, okay, come out to L.A. I said, okay, don't unpack. Okay, go to the airport. Where are we going, Hal? Uh, you'll see. We get to the airport, get on a plane, go to Maui for the weekend. Another time, met him in Las Vegas for the weekend. He's courting you. Oh, my God. <laughs> he won me over. He won me over on the trip to London. He came to New York 
And he says, uh, just pack a bag for the weekend. I said, okay. I think I could kind of get used to this. You know, maybe I need to kind of look at him a little differently. But six weeks after we started dating, he asked me to marry him. And I knew I wasn't ready for marriage. Not at that time. This was Hal Jackson, bigger than life, you know. And here I am, this person, <laughs> you know. But he was always humble. I never saw him as... Uh, the giant that he was because he was always such a warm, inviting person. And he won me over. <laughs> so you knew you were ready to get married no. and he was on you, Gun like white on rice. Gun -ho. That's why he was flying me all these different mm -hmm. places, showing me the kind Courting of life you. that yes. I could have. And I'm saying, mm. and my friends would say, are you crazy? That's Hal Jackson. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm not ready. How much older was he from you? 35 year difference. But you did, the, I mean, you would know that he was older, but you didn't know that it was that yeah. many years because he never looked his age. And he you never were? Looked his age. I was in my 30s. When okay. we got married, I was 37. Okay. And he was in his 60s okay. somewhere. Okay. You know, and that sounds a little strange, but he was never. He was a youngster. And he, he was, was on it. Hip. He, was he was on it. I go back yes. and I look at videos and I say, Yes. <laughs> That's a man I yes. married. You know, yes. this wonderful individual. So it took you six years to say yes. Finally. Okay. <laughs> okay. And if I had married him when he first asked me, it would never have worked mm -hmm. because I didn't know who I was. And um, being behind someone so huge, it would have taken me through something. And after the six years of really getting to know him and getting to know myself, I said, I could handle that because he had a temper. Yes, he did. That you didn't want to mess with. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned how to defuse him. Because he'd go off and I'd go, <laughs> you're yelling at me. And that would just bring him down. <laughs> right, because you didn't challenge him. No, I didn't. Not yes, at all. Yes, yes. I'm not a challenging kind of person. I just sit back. I internalize a lot of stuff, but I'm not that, I'm not that person that's going to go after you. Now... You marry him. It's not just marrying a big personality, but it's a whole different life. Yeah, it is. You're, I moved from the Bronx to a penthouse on Park Avenue. And the other thing about Hal is that Hal would just thrust you and stuff. Yes, he would. So now you're married, mm -hmm. and what did you get thrusted into? <laughs> Two things. <laughs> radio and Hal Jackson's Talented Teens. Now, in radio, that was kind of an easy transition because what I did was every Sunday, every Sunday, no matter what, for the time that he was on the air, and he was on the air close to 30 years, uh, we were on together. He never missed a Sunday. So our lives revolved around Sundays. But when I first started going there, I would be there, and we used to give things away, you know, CDs or, or tickets to different things. So... I would take down the names, give it to him or to Nisi Cologne, and she would announce them or he would announce the winners. Then one day he says to me, you announce it. I said, okay. <laughs> and that was my beginnings in radio. How did you get into uh, Hal Jackson's Talented Teens? My aunt was the director for New York. They were having a New York competition and I was the judge coordinator, so I was helping her with it. And he was sitting down front, he was living out here, sitting down front and I see him so I go down and I say hi Mr. Jackson I'm Debbie Bowling he says I know that's when he decided oh so you actually started earlier before you got married uh, was yes. working on the pageant in 81 so, okay it wasn't slapped in your face no. like now you no. got this okay no. No, okay no, 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 so, no. so it was started, a little easier I started with New York and I was the judge coordinator with, with that and then that same summer uh, Miss Labrie asked me to come on and be the judge coordinator for the international competition. And that one was at uh, the Waldorf Astoria. Okay. And I said, okay, no problem. And I spent the night there um, that night. And that morning, um, after the competition, he came into the room where I was sleeping. And he sat down on the bed, and he just rubbed my <laughs> hand. I, but I'm not, you know, I, I, I really rubbed my hand. I said, wow, his hands are so soft. soft. And he gave me his card with his number in New York and his number in <laughs> California. I, I don't know what I did with that card to this day. Oh, that's I wasn't interested. Right, right, right. And so I started um, working with the New so, York Competition so we'll back International. Up. 
it was a suite you were in. Yeah, we were in a suite. Yeah. yeah so he didn't like walk into your room. By oh no, 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 <laughs> no, no. Me too. Hashtag that was me a, too. No, no. That, that was a no, suite. No. Yeah, it was a suite. It was at the Waldorf. We had the yeah, presidential cause the, suite. Because yeah. the the pageant would always yes, uh, book suites, suite. so correct. that you could yes. do the work on yes. it. Yeah. 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 No. No. It wasn't like that at all. As a matter of fact, I didn't even think anything of it. You know, when he came in, because he, come on. You know how he, you know he he just came in and I didn't know that he was pursuing me. I had no idea. I didn't know. I didn't. I, I didn't know. So once you got married, you didn't have a crazy transition, but no. you had to deal with crazy people. Oh my God! You were coming in to adult children that yes. he had. Mm -hmm. You also were uh, having to deal with an ex-wife. So and an ex-mother-in-law. And an ex so you had a you you did have a lot to kind of navigate through. I did feel it from his kids. I didn't feel it from well, I did. Well, his wife was a little nuts. So there were things, you know, and then I had like Miss Labrie who was looking at me a little strange because, you know, it was her daughter that was married to right. Hal, and now here I am, yeah. and I'm married to Hal, and she always treated me nicely, you know, and I, I never felt any animosity at all from, from Miss Labrie. Your personality was able to navigate through yeah. those waters without That's it getting yeah. ugly. Right, because yeah. if I were a confrontational person, it I'm would have sure. been over. Yeah. You were married to Hal 25 years? 25 years. 25 years. That's no easy feat. No. You got this huge age difference. Mm -hmm. You're you're with a very traditional man. Yes. Who's also a celebrity. Yeah. Who also, <laughs> you know, women are like They're eager. After him. You did a lot of things that most women wouldn't do. Well, I loved him wholeheartedly yeah but it, it's it's beyond love I mean there are people who love each other but they cannot maneuver or navigate through difficult waters you had to take the back seat a lot of times I was always in the back seat it was Hal Jackson's Talented Teens it was Hal Jackson's Sunday Classics and I was there but see I'm a back seat person I don't okay. have to be up front okay you know I I'll do what needs to be done to keep it moving smoothly I don't have to be up front and so therefore it worked for me I never wanted to be on the air. We had a wonderful marriage, and I know that a marriage is like a seesaw. You know, sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down, and it isn't often that you're here. Mm -hmm. You're like this. You're giving ninety percent, or you're giving ten percent, and a lot of the times you're at ninety percent on the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but Hal was just a wonderful individual to be able to be uh, involved with, and and. Um, to be married to. You just loved how. Mm -hmm. You just loved the man. Mm -hmm. You weren't looking at, what was he going to give me? How's he going to give me this? Piece? And all of my friends were looking at that. Yes. And they thought I was crazy when I said, no, nah, nah, I don't want to marry him. See, the thing is, is that, like I said, I was married before. And so I knew the commitment that would have to be in it. You know, and I wasn't ready to do that. And I knew that I wasn't ready. A lot mm -hmm. of people get married and they think that they're ready for a commitment and they're not. I knew that I wasn't, and I waited until I was, and thank God he was still there. You also, during that time, was still nurturing it, even yeah. though you weren't... You... Well, no, 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 for a, for a, for a minute, oh, for okay. about nine months, I stopped having anything to do with him. I didn't accept his phone calls, I didn't see him, and that's because there was somebody in the back of my head Okay. who I said, I think I like this person mm. but it was lust and not love mm. you can't build a marriage on lust it has to be on love and friendship and but I had to find that out that's the wisdom that you figured that out yeah you know? I did I did and at that time nine months goals or ideas of you know I want this kind of life no nope. and, and I'm not saying with a marriage I'm just saying nope. in general I want to be I want to do this nope. I want to be this nope I knew that Hal wanted to marry me I had to find out I, I could not marry him knowing that there was something over here that I might go back to after I'm married and I, I didn't want to do that so I said let me go this way and see what happens and and that's when I knew for sure that Hal was who I wanted to be with. Mm. I remember one time we were walking, you know, the radio station was on 2nd Avenue, 801 2nd Avenue, and that's like a six lane street. We were coming around the corner and he looked across the street and he says, I gotta go over there. So of course I walked with him across the street. I thought he was going to the store. There was a guy sitting on the ground out there and he, gave, he went over and gave him money. And 
I said, you walked across the street to give this guy money? He says, yeah, usually he's on this side of the street. So that was one thing. I mean, it was just so many little things that he did. Just, he always treated everyone the same, from the janitor to the president of a company. So I, I, I saw that. And then, like, also, it, you know, my parents instilled that in me. Treat people the way you want to be treated. And he was, you know, number one, rah, rah, rah. If you wanted to do something, okay, how was behind you? He'll push you along and say, okay, you can do it. You can do it every day. There wasn't a day that he wasn't positive. He was always positive about anything that anybody wanted to do, but especially for me. I mean, there wasn't a day that went by that he didn't tell me he loved me. Every day for the 25 years that we were married, sometime during that day, he said, I love you, Debra. And he was the one who named me Debbie B because he wanted me to be an individual and not Debbie Jackson married to Hal Jackson. He wanted you to have your own identity. My, my own identity, and therefore on the air, when I went on the air, I would always talk about my boyfriends, but my boyfriends were always the Lionel Richies, the Michael mm -hmm. Jacksons, the Princes, you know, but I'd say, oh, it's one of my boyfriends coming up, you know, and it, it worked. Yeah. What were some of the things that you learned about radio because of Hal, the show? That people can be very fickle. Because Hal was who he was, people always treated him with the utmost respect. But I saw how other people were treated. You have to be nice. Nice to be important. Mm -hmm. But it's important to be nice. That was his, one of his mantras. he was mantras. always nice. And even when people weren't nice to him, well, he would let, he'd let you know mm -hmm. if, if mm -hmm. he had a problem with you. Well, he also was of that belief to put time on him. If put they time on did it. something, put, put time, time on, on it. Him. And I know of a lot of different things that happened. And he would just say, put time on it. And things would happen. People, uh, it was one person who was uh, going to the airport to to fire him and they got to the airport and had a heart attack and died. Yeah, hell. There was a, there was a special <laughs> thing around how when people mess with them. Things would happen. <laughs> They'd lose their jobs. I yeah, mean, I saw would it. Happen. I yeah, saw you don't it. mess with God's child. No, you don't. That I really believe God that God had his, his hand, hand on, on Hal. Hal. He did. I think what made Hal so generous, so kind, so giving was his upbringing. Yes. Because he had to fend for himself. himself from the time he was 14. Yes. What he got from you that I don't think he got before you was family. Mm. That he really wanted family. Yeah, he did. That was one of the, the greatest gifts you gave him was mm. a sense of family, a sense of that community. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think a lot of times people understand that uh, celebrity life is lonely. Yes, it is. You know, you got everybody, I love you, I love you, but then you Not go home by yourself right. and it's like, who, who loves me? Yeah. What what uh, to do? You right. know, and, that's true. Uh, and I think that you really anchored him in that mm -hmm. along with your energy. You had his back so he could soar and do whatever he wanted to do, knowing that home was secure mm. not only that but you were by his side you went to work with him every day when he went to work um, I went to work because he didn't have that as a kid oh that's true to yeah. have that as an adult and to have somebody who's supportive and there for him i i think that's why the latter half of his life was greater than the former you know mm. in the bible it talks about job and mm -hmm. And, and that the latter half of Job's life was more rich mm -hmm. and, and, and wealthy and, and, mm -hmm. and so much that he had stuff taken away. You know, he got through that difficult time and then God blessed him and not only restored to him what was stolen, but gave him double. Even more. You know, he went through a really dark period before you. You know, he got he got divorced and he was a little out of sorts. And I know that because mm -hmm. I was with him that during that transition, during that time. Maybe within a year, he and Alice uh, divorced. Mm -hmm. And even though she was still kind of in the picture for a mm -hmm. minute, he was devastated. He mm -hmm. really kept things going. But that, you know, when it was time to go home, he was a mess. Yeah, he was. He was and a mess. And apartment was a mess. Yeah, he was a mess. And, I, and, and we would go out to eat every night mm -hmm. because he didn't want to go home. And then when he got married to you, he started coming back to himself. And I think that you were the best thing that happened to him because 
he got to have what he never had before, mm -hmm. which was, I go back to somebody who supported him, mm -hmm. believed in him, cheered him on, and walked side by side with him. He comes from an era where women stayed at home. They that's raised true. their children. They did they, mm -hmm. that women were not to be career minded. Right. That's and true. he married a woman who was career minded and, mm -hmm. and she was phenomenal, but they were not that type of match. Right. He didn't know how to navigate those waters in a smoother kind of way because he would <laughs> and then she would <laughs> and they were <laughs> And so you come in the picture, you're not challenging him. You're not um, confronting him. You're not, you're not trying to be all that in a bag of chips. Mm -hmm. So that allowed him to be in peace. One of the reasons why he lived, which was the talented teens, that gave him so much joy mm -hmm. to be able to to help young people, because mm. he was about young people. Yes, he was. At all, at all always, the time. He always kept young people around him. Yeah, because yeah. it, it kept him young. He was yes. not one to... That's right. One thing about how you would never see him sitting, congregating with older, older people. people. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would say, hello, right. how you and doing? Keep it and keep moving. <laughs> but in his circle was always, always young. young, under 30. Mm -hmm. They were always mm -hmm. under 30. That's Over right. 30, you got to go. <laughs> it's true. It's so true. With talented teens, we we did that. I did that for thirty years. I started in eighty one, and we I and well we ended it in twenty ten because we had no sponsors, and we were spending a minimum of a hundred thousand dollars a year. That was a minimum, usually between one hundred thousand and two hundred thousand a year, just to do things the way that we were used to doing them because mm -hmm. we showed those kids a good time. In two thousand and nine, he said, "I'm not doing it anymore." I said, "But how?" It'll be our 40th year. We have to. He said, I'm not putting any more money in it. I said, okay. So I took $100,000 out of my retirement. Wow. And he was not happy with me. Wow. And used it so that we could do the 40th year. And people are now still saying, oh, you've got to do it. But I still award scholarships. Mm -hmm. You know, every year, minimum of five girls, I'll, I'll give wow. $1,000 to. That's beautiful. You know, in his name. In his last few days, what I was doing was I was telling people, y'all need to come and see him. Right? And it got to the point where Hal um, would drink prune juice because he wanted to keep himself mm -hmm. flowing, right? And the last night that he was at home, we had one of those toilets that you put, the mm -hmm. portable ones, mm -hmm. and um, I had home care. I had had a, a nurse that was there, um, and she came and she put him in a diaper, and he said, this ain't no way to live. And he was gone within 48 hours. Mm. And uh, everything with Inner City, they went bankrupt, and uh, you know, Emmis took over. Emmis was with Kiss FM. They took over the station, and then owned WBLS. Right. And, and Hal died on a Wednesday, and that Friday, I had to clean out his office because we were moving from Three Park Avenue downtown to where Emmis was. And when he died, people said he left here because he was not going to be an employee. He's an employer. I mean, he was right. he was two through. Um, inner city was his baby also you know that and talented team so he made it what it was yeah he, he made that what he it did was. he really did now I want to talk about life after Hal so I knew I had to move the house that I now live in I saw it while he was alive but I never brought him there because it's a split level with steps like seven steps and seven steps and he wasn't you know, that was sturdy I went back and got my dream house now it's oh, my wow. I'm, I, I'm done and 2010 I did the first I was the first person to do a photography exhibition at the state office building where there was just one person Wow because usually they have five people that bring their art and so it was all my photography wow. that was there so I'm doing photography and travel and the name of your company your photography business my photography business is photos by Debbie Jackson all right and my travel business is my feet travel I do landscape so I, I go to hotels like the one I'm staying at now one of my dreams is to take pictures of the hotel and then come back and tell them that they can you know take the pictures and put them into a calendar or put them up on the wall. It's Wonderful. pictures of their establishment. You take great pictures. Not only that, but you make yearly calendars. I make which calendars. I love. You are on a mission 
to get Hal a street yes. named after him. I sure am. So um, what can we do to help you make <laughs> that happen? I met with the board. What happened was Hal used to live on 135th Street and Lenox Avenue, right across from, well, diagonally across from the from Harlem Hospital. I said that I wanted to get a street named after him because he did so much for so mm -hmm. many different people. Where I wanted it was at 96th and Park where we lived uh, because he was there for over 30 years, but that district is not renaming any streets. So I said, okay, that it has to be Harlem. I saw another street, which was by Marcus Garvey Park, and you know, he used to yeah. um, host shows there. But then I said, no, where he used to live. So I met with the board, and I have this tablecloth that says, co-name Lenox Avenue slash Malcolm X Boulevard between 134th, 135th Street to Hal Jackson Way, because you know his song was my way. Because it could have been place or yes. way, and I said it has to be way. And uh, I have to get like a hundred and something signatures, and they've given me the permission. I will set up in their lobby. That building has 160 apartments. It was built in 1963, and he was one of the first tenants to move in there. So I'm going to set up in their lobby for like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and within that time, I should have the signatures needed. I'll take it to District 10 and get that ball rolling. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let you know when the unveiling is so that you can come. Yes, <laughs> and I say to everybody who loved Hal, who who knew Hal or listened to Hal, uh, let Debbie know how much he meant to you mm -hmm. on her Facebook page. I'll put all the links down so you mm -hmm. can get it. It's right available for you. But let her know what Hal meant to you because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people out there and you're probably listening and watching that... Hal touched you personally. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would just be nice to celebrate him by just saying what he did for you or, or listening to him, how it made you feel. You know, it's always nice when we hear about our loved ones and, and what they meant to somebody else. So I ask you to give back a little bit. And I say to you, if you live near the vicinity where we want Hal Jackson Way, please help Debbie sign that paper. And if you don't live there, and you know somebody who lives there, please tell them to sign. I leave you with something that Hal would always say, mm -hmm. and that was, what you believe, you can achieve. Mm -hmm. So you just need to believe in what you want, mm -hmm. and then start making little steps towards it. And you'll be so surprised at how, you, how quickly you get there just by moving a little bit at a time, but just keep your ball moving, make it happen.